telling the last service that probably twice a week I get a call, one from Texas and one from an 800 number that I never pick up because the call from Texas is from a prison and the voicemail always says something like, you are receiving a call from whatever correctional facility to accept the charges and I don't know anyone in prison in Texas. Uh, if one of you has a family member that you're trying to put in contact with me, let me know and I'll answer the phone. Uh, but the second message is always, this is your mobile provider. Our service does not allow you to accept phone calls from whatever, prisons or people that are charging by the way that they're charging, and they call me at least once a week. And I never pick up the message because it's not for me. At least I hope it's not for me. As far as I know, it's not for me. It's this idea that there are messages being directed and sometimes they go to the wrong person. Sometimes this person, whatever their need is, they're trying to reach someone, but they keep getting connected to me. I hope my name's not scratched on a wall somewhere. Uh, that's happened before. Um, so sometimes the message is to the wrong person. Sometimes the message is to the right person, but it's not good news. You see the number on a phone after a loved one's been in the hospital, or you see the number on the phone when you know someone's in trouble and your heart sinks because the message is for you, but it's not good news. And then sometimes, even when it is good news for you, it's not good news for someone else. You know, so someone says, well, did you get the job? And you said, I got it, I got the job. And then the person goes home who also wanted the job, and they said, did you get the job? And they go, no, I didn't get the job. And they're devastated or they're sad. And so the good news directed towards you because becomes someone else's bad news. And so the reason I bring all this up, whether it's the problem of messages misdirected to the wrong person, or whether it's good news, but not good news for everyone, is Christmas is the event or the occasion, maybe the one occasion we can appoint, point to, where the news that is given is a message of good news for great joy for all people. That's what the angel says. The angel shows up. If you've seen the new Star Wars, they're flying in and out of light speed all the time. Like, boom, 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 boom. In, out, in, out. It's like the angel shows up. Boom, light speed. And says, don't be afraid because everyone's terrified because the, the shepherds assume, like my calls from prison, that whoever this is, it's not for us. Why would an angel show up to us? We haven't done anything. We're not anybody of note. This must be a message for somebody else. And fortunately, there's not a mobile provider who comes after the angel going, your service does not allow you to receive messages from angels. So when the angel shows up, they're terrified. And they're terrified that the message is going to be bad news. And so the angel says, do not be afraid. And sometimes when we expect to hear from the divine, or sometimes when we expect to hear from heaven, we assume that the word God's going to give us is going to be bad. That God's sort of the cranky, angry father. God's the relative at Christmas that you go, hey, don't make him mad. Look, just get through dinner. Don't make him mad. And then he'll go home and everything will be fine. This message is a message of good news, of great joy for all the people. And it's the one message we might say that's for everyone. And it's funny because if you go and look at the Greek text, it actually says, for all people. I mean, the translators had it nice and easy. This is a message for everyone. And we might say that this is the time where those who have been excluded from good news finally get to be included in that beloved community of belonging where finally it's for them too. Now we hear a little bit more about this and how God accomplishes something so vast and wonderful and it's even more surprising when we see the mechanics of the gift. But we heard in that reading from Isaiah that Paul read when the prophet says, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. The people who walked in the shadow of death, the shadow of the grave, on them light has shined. And he says, those who had the rod of the oppressor on their back, it has been broken as in the days of Midian. And maybe when Paul read that, you had a chill go down your spine and go, ooh, the days of Midian. Ah, I remember them well. Or you just go, well, it's more Bible talk that it probably refers to something. We don't know what it was. 
Why is it that when the prophet talks about light being brought, he references the cruel oppressor's rod on their shoulders broken like in the days of Midian? And when you remember that story, or if you hear it for the first time tonight, you understand the mechanics of how God does what God does, but on an even greater scale at Christmas. When God brings this message, the way God does it is astounding. And it is beyond our normal habits of acquisition. Because in our acquisitive appetites, we never have enough. We go, well, no, I'll just take a little more. Well, I'll take one and save it. I'll, no, I just need a little bit more. If I have a little bit more, I'll have enough. Well, I'm just saving it in case I retire, whatever. We're always acquiring because we're afraid we're not going to have enough. So the order of the day is more. And so the story of the days of Midian goes back to Jerubbabel, whose name is Gideon, but also Jerubbabel, but we'll just call him Gideon. Um, after you've had a few eggnogs, it's hard to say Jerubbabel. Um, I haven't yet. I'll have that after the service. Um, but Gideon is chosen by God to release the oppressor's rod from the Midianites. And the Midianites are a group of people who have a sort of military, uh, coercive, fearful um, monopoly on God's people. They're in charge and they enforce their power through fear and violence. And so Gideon gets the news that he's going to assemble or muster an army uh, to be able to break the cruel oppressor's rod and he musters 32,000. Pretty good. Even for a modern military, 32,000, you can do something with that. And God comes to Gideon and Gideon says, good, look, good, good news, God. Not of great joy to all people, but good news to you. Uh, I have 32,000. And God goes, no, 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 too many. Too many? He goes, no, 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 too many. I don't want you to think that when you win, it's because of you. I want you to know for sure it was because of me. And then Gideon goes, well, I mean, we could probably just remind ourselves. And he goes, no, cut the military. Cut it. Cut the budget. He goes, all right, so they start cutting, and we won't go into all the details, but they cut 32,000 down to 300, and they make sure that they have the 300 biggest losers of any military you could have to make sure that no one confuses their victory as a matter of technological supremacy, tactical supremacy. It is because God causes the victory, or God brings the victory with just 300. And it's interesting because the battle plan is, and Gideon takes some coaxing, which probably isn't a surprise. The battle plan is go with a shofar in one hand, a trumpet, uh, go with an empty jar in the other hand that has a torch in it, and we're going to surround the camp, and when the time comes, we're going to blow the horns, we're going to take out our torches, and, and the noise and the light is going to cause the darkness to feed on itself and collapse on itself. That's the plan. And they're like, okay, we just need to, so 300 losers, 300 people who would be released, uh, chaptered out of today's military, they go with their empty jars and they go with their horns, and that's exactly what happens. And they win. They break the cruel oppressor's rod with nothing, militarily speaking, except a little bit of light and some joyful noise and God. And so when we think about this night, and when we think about this prophecy from Isaiah, the only thing we need is a little joyful noise, which we've already provided, a little bit of light, which we'll also be doing as we come up, but even more so the announcement that God is the one who saves. And it doesn't require technological supremacy. It does not require tactical supremacy. It is God by God's own power. And for Christmas... God doesn't go, I've deployed 300 babies around the world and they will unite. And by their uniting, we will save the, the, the nation. God does it with one. Not even 300. God does it with one. I am sending just one. And by this one child, it will be enough to save you. It will be enough to break the cruel oppressor's rod. It will be enough to shine light into the darkness of the grave. It will be enough to take the garments rolled in blood and to burn them in the fire that he brings, the fire of his peace. It will be enough. And now we say, well, what a gift. A message of good news, of great joy for all people, secured by one person. And then we find out that when the one person comes, there's no room for him. And that's an important part of the story too. 
that God's gift comes into a world that cannot create room for the gift that he brings. And that can be something that we're challenged with too as human beings, is that the society we create, the personalities we develop, can oftentimes be closed off from creating any room for someone else. Or for the baby Jesus. It says in the very famous line, well, they were there and they ended up having the baby and there was no room for them in the inn. But it's not like they were on Hotels.com and he goes, well, I found a best Western. Well, I guess they have the continental breakfast. We'll stay there. They don't have any of that. They have the hospitality of relatives and the inn is this room, sort of the guest room within the house and the stables underneath the house. And these people who are probably their relatives, and who knows, will give them the benefit of the doubt. They're overwhelmed by the census, and there's just too many people to host. Even when one of the relatives is having a baby, no one lets her in the house. They keep her downstairs with the animals. Maybe they go, we just got the carpets cleaned. We don't want the baby over. We don't know what the problem was, except that they don't welcome them in. There is no room for this gift. And God doesn't say, you know what? Until you find me room, I'm not coming. God is born into a room with no room, or God is born into a world with no room, so that every person who's been excluded from good news will now have a friend, will now have someone who shares solidarity with them. Now think about this for the state of California. The state of California has 25% of all the United States homeless. Now we can say it didn't just happen overnight. It's a very complex social economic health, all these things intertwined into a complex problem, otherwise it would be easy to solve. But I think we can say as a summary that we have created a society, all of us together, whether it's the people in charge or people going, I don't have anything to do with it, I'm just trying to stay in my lane. We together have created a society that has left out 25% of the country's homeless. And we didn't mean to, I don't think any of us meant to, but somehow what we've created has excluded a large number of people. And we might say that Christmas is a challenge to us. Christmas is a challenge to all of us who don't have room for one more to recognize that when we open space in our lives for strangers, for enemies, and that's a big one for the Christian gospel, not just making space for your friends, but making space for your enemies, that when we open up that space, we are keeping the gift of Christmas. Christmas is not just one night where we go, well, that was nice. Put it away until next year. Every time we recognize that by opening space for someone else, we are celebrating Christmas because we may be opening up space for Christ. Christ in our neighbor, Christ in our enemy, Christ in our friends, Christ in ourselves, and Christianity becomes a wonderful challenge to inferior senses of community. We open up the possibility of beloved community for the world. Now, it's not easy, but one baby was enough, and so we do it one person at a time, and that becomes part of the light that we bring. I mean, think again, back to the Midianites. Think to that battle that they won. All they had were horns to make some noise, empty jars that they hid their light in, and at just the right time, they took out the light, and they say, God's already won the battle. And part of what we're doing here tonight on Christmas night, and something we do when we gather again to talk about the cross of Jesus, to talk about the resurrection of Jesus is to pull out that light again and say, God's already won. And part of our life is living into the freedom of that victory, living into the freedom that God has offered us, extending the dignity of freedom to others, especially those who may not be like us, and to say that we who once walked in darkness have seen a great light, and it is the light that has brought us back to ourselves as it's brought us back to God. Amen.